Amy Marks chorus, Chris Ranji on the show on KMOX. As I mentioned that at this time, it, it seems like there are people, in particular young women, young girls, uh, teenage girls, that are having more sadness than usual and also are at a greater risk of suicide. Licensed professional counselor and founder of the Brain Performance Center, Lee Richardson, is visiting with us now as we go to the guest line on KMOX. Good morning, Lee. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. So just a general overview of this, because there have been a number of pieces written about this lately. It, how much greater is the risk and the sadness for girls at this age, at the younger adolescent age, than there used to be? Well, you know, you, that's a really good question because, honestly, before the pandemic, one out of four Americans over the age of 12 was suffering from a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue. So this is something that's been going on for a while. What has happened, it's become a, more in in the limelight. And I think that, you know, it's it's terrifying to think that one in three girls in the last, in this survey, has been sexually assaulted. And when you look at the number of people that that are just sad and have lost hope, and I think a lot of that's what we've been through in the last few years. Those high school girls is what they're focusing on. And as they went through the pandemic, they actually lost their norm. Mm -hmm. they, they lost their, their life. I mean, their community was a school. And whatever they did during school, whether it was band or choir or drill team or cheer, whatever it was, that kept them connected. And when that connection is gone, we, we do get sad. And it's almost like I've talked with a number of young people in my, at the center, and they're grieving. They're, they're grieving for their old norm. Lee, the New York Times had a story about teen girls recording record levels of sadness. Those findings were from the CDC. They give some of these statistics, one of which is the one that you mentioned, that three in five teen girls felt persistent sadness in 2021. One in three teen girls seriously considered suicide, which is just a shocking number. And they, they visit a hospital in New York that it was the Long Island Jewish Medical Center in New York City. In 1982, there were 250 ER visits for suicidal teens. In 2010, that hospital saw 3,000 ER visits for suicidal teens. And in 2022, that hospital saw 8,000 visits for suicidal teens. And we see these record numbers of depression and harmful actions, and it feels uh, overwhelming. Definitely, there's a marker there in that 2010 year, the advent of smartphones, social media. What do we know about the effects of smartphones and social media on the mental health of teens, specifically teen girls? We've seen, I've seen a number of studies that do link the social media to the impact of their mental health because social media places us in a comparative society. I mean, there's always somebody that's got a better dress. There's always somebody that's got a better car, no matter what you're looking at. And it forces a win-lose situation. And if you feel like you're always the loser, I know what that would do to my mental health. And suicide is a leading cause of death for people from age 10 to 34. And that's a heartbreaker. In, in 2020, in the United States, there was one suicide death every 11 minutes. So it's, it's getting worse. And it's something that I'm so grateful that to be able to talk about this on the radio with both of you, because it's all about creating awareness and stop, look, and listen to what is going on and around you. And I can't tell you how many teenagers have said, I can't talk to my parents. No, I, I just, I cannot do it. And if you can't talk to your parents, please find an adult that you can talk to. 
that same New York Times piece, and you, and you you touched on this too, that you're you're seeing an increase in sexual assaults of mm-hmm. adolescent women. Um, it, it's something like fourteen percent, and for gay, lesbian, or bisexual adolescents, it's twenty percent. Why are those numbers going up? Well, that's a really good question because something's driving it up, and I think that 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 goes to the root cause. Why is the abuse occurring? Is that act of frustration? Is that an act of hopelessness? Because everybody that gets, when mental health is brain health, and the brain is an organ just like the the heart's an organ, but we don't pay attention to it. I mean, if we think that we've got a problem with our heart, we are at the doctor within days. But if we think that we have a problem with our mental health, we don't think about our brain. And there's that is the root cause. What is going on in the brain? And I say this hundreds of times every week. Everything you do, everything you don't do, it's what's going on in the brain. And there's it, the brain gets res, dysregulated because of genetics, physical trauma, emotional trauma, and stress. And the, since 2020... The last three years, the clients and myself included, I've met stress in a whole new way. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that with girls and with boys, often depression manifests differently. With girls, you overwhelmingly see sadness and hopelessness. With boys, depression can often manifest itself in irritability and aggression. So if you're a parent right now of a teen girl or a teen boy and you're having that nagging feeling that something is not right, that your child, uh, their behavior is off or unusual, how as a parent do you address that? How do you approach your child? Talk to them and let them know that there's nothing off limits. There's nothing wrong. There's no shame. There's no blame. There's nothing but love and care coming at them. And a lot of times, people with the teenagers that I've worked with at the clinic, they feel like they have nowhere to go. And every, every parent should know 988 is the new national mental health hotline. And, and tell your, tell your kids, you know, if you feel like something that is so serious that you can't talk to me, call 988. Or if you, if you have another adult in your life, an aunt, an uncle, um, a band teacher, someone. But if I was a parent with the children in that age range, I would encourage them to talk to their, talk about it, get people connected, and do the best that you can to let them know it is okay to not be okay. And and that number is is good. I th- I think it's good to remind people that it's even if you. Th- for yourself, whoever you are, if you think you might be kind of feeling something, but not even really sure, like if it, you know, I know a lot of people just want to say, well, I can, I can handle it. Um, it's not a bad idea to call that number anyway, like regardless of, of how, uh, you know, how devastated you feel or how intense those feelings are. Absolutely not. And the difference with that number is you've got trained counselors answering that number instead of when you called 911. And, and it was 911 was a great avenue, but it typically went and had to a dispatch that sent a police officer. And police officers are wonderful people, but their job is not mental health. So the advantage with 988 is you're going to talk to a mental health professional. And, and so you, you know, you said talk to your your kid if you feel like something is off. Is it? How do you know if something is off? Or because you know, for some people who are depressed, and usually it's adults, it, at least in my experience, you don't really know they're depressed because they act normally. I mean, everything seems to be fine with them. Is it different with kids? Are there different things to look for with kids than you would with an adult? I absolutely, and I would focus on looking for changes in their behavior. Are they sleeping a lot more? Has their diet changed? Are they not eating at all? Are they eating way too much? Are they isolating more? Are the things that they used to, to love to do, playing with walking the dog, are they no longer doing that? 
look for those changes in their behavior because those are red flags just as just as pronounced and said you know screaming i need help i need help and teenagers in my experience are so reluctant to do that mm -hmm. And, and part of that's because maybe your family is going through a stressful time. And kids pick up everything. Kids know what's going on in the household. And I can't tell you how many kids I've had say to me, Lee, I don't want to add to the, uh, to the burden. I don't want to make things worse in the house. Mm -hmm. So look for changes in behavior. And uh, there's, there's only two answers to every question. Every question you ask, are you okay? Yes or no. Hmm. And, and Lee, before we let you go, if maybe a parent is noticing or has that gut feeling that parents get, that something maybe isn't, it's not depression yet, but they're noticing, you know, social media doesn't bring out the best in her or, you know, being on her phone or even this, you know, group of friends doesn't bring out the best in her you know, to encourage parents to get involved sooner rather than later and maybe be intentional to say, let's take a break from the phone. Let's go on a walk. Let's go play outside. Let's have a family game night. Just anything you can do to encourage interaction versus isolation. Very well said. Very well said. The more that you can keep them connected to what's going on, even if it's sit down and watch a comedy show with them on TV, and listen to some music that you may not want to listen to, but you know they do. Lee, we appreciate your, your time once again. Um, thank you for the great information, and, and thank you for uh, you know passing that along to people listening, because I know there are a lot who are affected. Thank you for having me. That is Lee Richardson, licensed professional counselor and founder of The Brain Performance Center. Again, the 988 number is very important. That's a great resource for anybody who might be feeling depression or any uh, suicidal thoughts at all.